I gave a small smile to the woman seated across from me, attempting to look as hospitable as one can at a table that's bolted to the floor. Hi, I'm Sarah, I'm a chaplain. The woman nods once. I'm here to talk or to listen or pray or meditate if that's something you would like. I take a moment to reset my focus. There's always a million things happening on the unit. I can hear the sound of showers and the toilet, the sound of a guard calling last names for med checks, of a woman crying into the payphone against the other wall. It's the least private place one can imagine with open beds and detainees wandering around to pass the time. It's not exactly what would, one would call an ideal environment for spiritual caregiving. I'd like you to pray for me, she says. Of course. What do you want me to pray for? The woman begins to tell me pieces of her story. She talks some about what is happening on the inside, but focuses more on what's happening outside the jail. She tells me about her friends and her children, about the concerns she has for them. And then she says to me, I've been praying for them too, but I know that your prayers count more. Well, what do you mean? My prayers can't make it through the ceiling. I know that yours go directly to God. My breath, it catches in my chest. And I wonder for a moment if someone taught her that. Did someone tell her that her prayers didn't count? Or that only someone like me, an ordained clergy, had the power to get to God? Or I wonder if maybe this is a reflection of her detention, that her prayers are as trapped as she is within Cook County Jail. I've been trained as a chaplain to meet people where they are. I don't typically correct theology. Instead, I try to work within a person's belief system to offer meaning and whatever connection I can. But this time, I can't stop the words that fall out of my mouth. I will certainly pray for you. But I also believe that your prayers matter. I think that God can hear us wherever we are, even here. She just looks at me expectantly. So I reach out and I take her hands. It's the only physical contact that's allowed. I had to sign a form that said that the only touch will be holding hands during prayer. So I know that this is important and I give her hands a squeeze. And I say, let's pray. If I asked you where God is located, what would you say? As humans, we have ideas about where God dwells. In the holy of holies, on the mountaintop, in the sanctuary, in a big, big house with lots and lots of room. But perhaps the most common idea or prevailing image is that God lives somewhere up. God hangs out somewhere above our heads, watching our actions and receiving our prayers from above. Our theological imaginations are influenced by centuries of stories and images, painting after painting of God dwelling in the clouds. 
Maybe that's why the detainee felt her prayers were getting stuck. They couldn't make it through the ceiling to God's mailbox. Many of us reflexively feel that God is up. And yet, stories like today's are difficult to understand. At least they're difficult sometimes to understand for me, because they work against modern science. How exactly do we understand the ascension of Jesus when we know about gravity? And if Jesus were somehow to levitate off the ground, we know that he wouldn't just keep floating to some pearly gates, but rather through several layers of atmosphere and into the infinity of space. So the ascension of Jesus can be tricky for contemporary Christians. And sometimes when things are tricky, we like to just move on past them with little interrogation or comment. Yes, the ascension, as it is described in the text that Mary read, is cosmologically impossible. And at the same time, it is theologically crucial. The ascension of Jesus is celebrated 40 days after Easter, which technically was Thursday. Jesus spent 40 days with his followers after the resurrection, 40 days of appearances and fellowship and conversation and teaching. So the resurrection and the ascension are, in this way, tied together. Sandwiching this 40-day period, and yes, your ears should prick up at 40 days. 40 is an important number. 40 years wandering in the wilderness. Jesus spends 40 days preparing for his ministry. 40 days, resurrection, ascension. Resurrection revealing the triumph of God's love and ascension revealing the fellowship of all creation. Reverend Ronald Cole Turner writes of this moment in a way that I like, saying, the distance bridged in this moment is not measured in the number of miles from earth to heaven, but in the amount of evil and destruction that separates us from God. It is not the force of gravity that must be overcome, but the forces of sin, death, hell, and annihilation. The ascension of Jesus is not about floating from earth to heaven, although I will say that has created some of my favorite religious paintings. I love the images of the disciples looking up at a cloud that just has two little feet sticking out from it. But the ascension's not really about that. It's really about oneness with God. It is about the simple truth that nothing, nothing can separate us from God. Not sin, not death, not evil forces, not prison ceilings. This is about the fullness of God's story. Just as Jesus is gathered into that fullness of God, so are we. It's a beautiful movement. And yet, and yet, Jesus is gone. I wonder if the disciples were ready for that. I wonder who may have felt that God was suddenly distant or absent. I wonder who may have cried out, Jesus, where did you go? Jesus, we need you here. Jesus, how could you leave me? God, how could you? I wonder how many cried out something similar this week. In the wake of yet another horrific act of violence. In the midst of another pile of blasphemous thoughts and prayers disconnected from any intention 
to actually do something. And that's what blasphemy actually is, right? It's less about cursing and more about using God's name for something that you don't actually mean. I wonder how many of us carry this into the sanctuary this morning. Maybe how many are sitting with it right now. The sense that Jesus is gone and we're utterly alone. It's small comfort, but I think comfort nonetheless to know that we are not the first to feel this way. Psalm 13 cries out, how long, O Lord? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? We're not the first to feel this way. The Israelites repeatedly questioned God's presence in those 40 years in the wilderness, fearing that they are left alone. And the prophet Ezekiel actually tells of God withdrawing from the people after their continued idolatry. No, we're not the first to feel this way, and we certainly will not be the last. It's part of the human experience. Maybe it's moments like the one this week. Maybe it's a new diagnosis. Maybe it's depression. Maybe it's job loss. It's part of the human experience. And in many ways, it's part of the Christian experience. To find ourselves gazing upward, wondering what in the world we do now. Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? The disciples whip their heads around, surprised to find that they're now accompanied by these two angelic beings. Why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who you saw being taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go. In other words, what are you standing around for? What are you waiting for? You saw him go. You heard him say he will return. And don't you have something to do in the meantime? Jesus, in the ascension, is physically gone from the earth. But that doesn't mean that the disciples are alone. Look back to verse 2. Until the day Jesus was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. Yes, Jesus is physically gone, but the disciples aren't alone. The Holy Spirit is in the community. We hear this again in the Gospel of John, chapter 14. I have said these things to you while I am still with you. But the Advocate, the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom God will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. The Holy Spirit is within and among the community, with and among the people. This will be made all the more clear at Pentecost. That's what follows today's text. Pentecost, when the disciples are filled with this Holy Spirit and gain this ability to communicate across difference, across language and culture and race. I know I'm previewing next week, but isn't it amazing and remarkable that one of the first things that happens after Jesus physically leaves is that the Holy Spirit fills the people to talk across their differences? I think that's important. Why do you look up? The angels remind the disciples that they can't just passively wait around until Jesus returns, they have work to do. It's now their job to physically be the hands and feet and mouth and presence of God in the world. 
It's their job now to teach and heal and encourage and serve. My friends, so it is with us. When God seems distant or veiled, and there will be times when God seems distant or veiled, we need to turn to the Holy Spirit that's in the community. Right here, at home, with friends, in the neighborhood, in the city. We must turn to one another for comfort for expressions of righteous anger, and for returning to our work of tilling God's garden, of working with the Holy Spirit to bring a piece of the kingdom of heaven to earth. So my message this morning is simple. Stop looking up. Stop waiting for Jesus to return and fix it. Yes, yes, there will be a day, I believe, when we are all gathered into that eternal presence of God, when God wipes away every single tear from our eyes and brings us to this river of living water. But until then, God has given us work to do. And God has given us the tools we need to do the work. We have been filled with creativity and intellect and compassion and communal resolve and perhaps most importantly, the Holy Spirit. It's right here. Do you feel your heart beating? Do you feel your breath? That's the Holy Spirit. It's in each and every one of you, I promise. It is good and it is right for us to lament. That's a sacred act. It is important, especially in a world that wants to move on so fast from the bad thing. We need to lament. But when we're ready, we have to move forward again to be those hands and feet and voice and hope, hope of Jesus in the world. Stop looking up. Stop looking up and start looking around. Look for a hand you can hold or a meal that you can serve somebody. Look for a protest you can go to or a call you can make. Look for the Holy Spirit in the face of the person sitting next to you here or on the train or maybe even in traffic or behind you in the Starbucks line when it's really hard to see the Holy Spirit because it's early and you haven't gotten your coffee yet. Stop looking up and start looking around at the brokenness and at the flowers that bloom in the cracks of it. Look for the Holy Spirit and don't you dare let the evil forces of this world rob you of hope. That's what they want. We're not alone. We're not unequipped. So let's get to work. Amen.